Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. All right, good evening. Tonight is uh, the last Sunday evening of the month, so we're going to be doing our questions and answers this evening. I had, uh, what is it, three or, f I have four questions uh, submitted for this month. The first one is, uh, in Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29, Jesus did not partake of the Lord's Supper. What is the significance of him waiting until we get to heaven to share with him. So if you go there, Matthew 26, let's read the passage, 26 to 29. It says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. All right, so um, I, after reading all of the accounts uh, in, in the three of the Gospels where it is recorded and also in 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul mentions uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper, I'm not completely convinced that Jesus did not partake of the Lord's Supper here when he institutes it. Basically what we have going on is they had had a meal, a Passover meal, and then when the meal was concluded, he, he took this time to institute or to start the Lord's Supper. He may not, when you read it, it's hard to say whether, I mean, he broke the bread and gave it to the disciples. Did he keep any for himself? It, it, that's not really clear. In the same way with the fruit of the vine, he distributed it to his disciples, but that didn't mean that he didn't have some uh, as well. He may have, may have taken it, or he may not have. He says, though, that um, he will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on. And so that, to me, at least leaves a possibility that he, he did take the fruit of the vine here when he first institutes uh, the Lord's Supper. So the question was, what is the significance of him waiting until we get to heaven to share with him? So the, in verse 29, he says, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. I think what he was telling his disciples there is that this was the last time he was going to be sharing a meal with them. And the fact that he says that he will partake in heaven to me, I, I don't think that should be taken literally as um, he's going to literally take a meal with them in heaven or take the Lord's Supper with them in heaven. I think what he's, what he's getting at and, and what he's pointing out is the drinking of the fruit of the vine with his disciples in heaven. It's probably a reference or, um, I don't know, a metaphor or whatever uh, for sharing the blessings of heaven and the fellowship that they will have there. Uh, with God, I don't think that they're going to. We're going to take the Lord's Supper in heaven. Uh, if you remember, Paul tells us in First Corinthians eleven that one of the purposes of the Lord's Supper is that we proclaim His death till He comes, and so well, that's one of the things we do. We're proclaiming His death till He comes. So after He comes, that would infer to me. Uh, that we will not be partaking of the Lord's Supper the way that we do. So I don't, I don't literally think the Lord's Supper is going to be observed in heaven with Jesus. I think what he was saying was, this is the last time I'm going to share a meal with you, and the next time we share a meal, so to speak, will be in heaven. And that, I think, entails the, all the blessings of heaven that will be given to us there. Okay, this next question is, uh, what is the sin that leads unto death in 1 John 5? Um, and then it says, is it unrepented sin? 
So technically, I could just say yes and move on, and we'd be done. That is my view. Uh, let's go ahead and look there at 1 John 5, uh, verses 16 and 17. I'm not going to just move on, because if I did, the sermon would only be about 10 minutes. I know you all want more than that. So uh, verses 16 and 17. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, is sin and there is, a, is sin not leading to death. All right, the passage says, if anyone sees a brother sinning a sin... We're talking, first of all, about a brother or sister in Christ. The sin that they are committing is one that can be seen. Okay, You see a brother or sister sinning a sin. And I think the reason it's worded that way is it's talking about, it's pointing out the fact that this is an ongoing sin. Okay, sinning a sin. It's not like we talked about this morning where, you know, the Christian commits isolated acts of sin uh, and then, you know, repents and tries to do better. But this is an ongoing sin here that uh, John is talking about. Now he says there is a sin not leading to death. I don't believe that we're talking about physical death. We're talking about spiritual death. And in one sense, all sin does lead to spiritual death. Romans 6 and verse 23. But if we confess our sin to God if we obey the gospel or for the Christian, if we confess our sin to God, he forgives us and ultimately we don't die uh, spiritually as a result. So that, in my mind, would be the sin not leading to death. First John 1 and verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we see a brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, which means that, you know, he confesses his fault and, and by implication he repents of that sin, then we're to pray for them and they'll be given life or, or they'll be forgiven. We are not to pray for those sinning a sin that does lead to death. So if God is willing to forgive any sin that we confess, then the sin which leads to death must be sin that is not confessed and by implication sin that is, is not repented. Of, In other words, a brother who is sinning or living in sin and will not confess it and will not repent of that sin, it does no good to pray for such an individual. We know that God will not forgive them if they do not repent of that sin. So if they refuse to repent, it does no good to pray for that. God will not answer that prayer. If there's no repentance, they're going to perish. Luke 13 and verse 3. So if we were to pray that God forgive a person who is sinning a sin, uh, living in sin, uh, and we ask God to forgive that person, then we're actually praying for something against God's will. <clears throat> now closely related to that, to the sin leading unto death, uh, a lot of people think about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and they Maybe they think that, uh, sometimes they think blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the sin leading unto death. I don't, um, I don't necessarily think they are the same thing. If you want to, look at uh, Matthew chapter 12, where Jesus talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. In verses 31 and 32, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, will be, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now Jesus says that, he said those words in response to something that had happened a few verses up. In Matthew 12 and verse 24, um, it says, when the Pharisees heard it, Jesus had cast a demon out of somebody. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. So they had seen a miracle, Jesus casting out an unclean spirit. 
these, these miracles were works of the Holy Spirit. And rather than believe, which is what you know, we hope a, an open-hearted and good person would do, they accuse him of working for the devil, and that that is why he was able to cast out a demon. So Jesus says if anybody speaks against him, they, they can still be forgiven. But if somebody speaks against the Holy Spirit, um, that they cannot be forgiven. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are both part of the Godhead, though. So why is it that it seems like the penalty for speaking against the Holy Spirit is so much worse and unforgivable, whereas speaking against Jesus is not unforgivable. What's the difference? I think the answer is this. Those who spoke against Jesus could still find pardon, could still find forgiveness. Um, there were many there on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 who had taken part and who had you know, um, voiced their approval of the crucifixion of Jesus. And yet, uh, in Acts chapter 2, verses you know, 36 to 38, Peter tells them, if you repent and are baptized, um, they could have the remission of sins. So that I think when Jesus says, if you speak against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, he may have had that type of situation in mind, that some of the people who were speaking against him, they could still be forgiven it uh, later on down the line. However... If one rejects the Holy Spirit and his teachings, he's rejecting God's final plan of salvation for mankind, if you will. For example, you know, it's almost as if um, Jesus is saying, if you will not believe the, this work that you've seen, an obvious miracle done by the Holy Spirit, he's saying... Nothing's going to convince you. Nothing is going to, at this point, convince you that I am who I claim to be if I can do these miracles and you still do not believe. So I think that, it, that is the sense um, that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit um, is the unforgivable sin in that as long as one continues to um, blaspheme the Holy Spirit, which again, and also in my mind, entails his word and blaspheming his word, then you're rejecting God's plan of salvation. And that's, that's unforgivable. As long as you do that, you're, you're not going to receive the remission of your sins. I don't think that that is not something we can't come back from. Okay. If a person quits blaspheming the Holy Spirit, I think they can be forgiven. But I think what Jesus had in mind is that a person who was so hard-hearted and see that miracle and say it was the power of the devil, he knew that they were never going to, nothing would convince them. And so he says that's, that's an unforgivable sin. Okay. So what, the person did answer the question correctly. They say, is it unrepented sin? Yeah, I believe that is. Um, the, un, the sin that leads unto death. Um, Technically, all sin leads to death, but not, not so if we, if we uh, obey the plan of salvation. So uh, the sin that leads to death is the one that's unrepentant, the one that is, um, we never take care of. <clears throat> okay, question number three is, um, in what way is fornication the only sin that is committed against one's own body in contrast to gossiping, drunkenness, etc.? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. And I want to read um, verses 13 to 20. Verses 13 to 20. Paul says, Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. 
Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So the question is, in what way is fornication the only sin that is committed against your own body? I think what that phrase means is that um, fornication is a sin against your own body because in committing fornication, your body becomes the very instrument of the sin. Okay, Your body is the instrument of sin that you are using to commit that sin. And so I think that's what that means, that it's a sin against our own body. And Paul puts forth several reasons that um, that is a sin, that that is wrong to commit fornication. Um, he, I read that whole passage because he's talking about the body and its purpose and its uses. In verse 13, he says, the body is not for sexual immorality. There in, in verse 13, when he says, foods for the stomach and stomach for foods, what, he see, what, what he's implying is that, and you, you'll hear this sometime, sometimes, is that, well, God made us with sexual desires. He made us male and female, so therefore it's okay. You can, you can have sexual relations with anyone you want because God made us that way. He must want us to do that. Okay, foods for the stomach and stomach for food. Paul says, wait a second. The body is not for sexual immorality. So the body's not for sexual immorality, verse 13, but it's for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. He says our bodies are going to be raised one day. Our bodies are members of Christ. And that fornication is a sin against our body. We're using those very bodies that God has given us as an instrument of sin or a means of committing sin. But our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies were bought with a price and they belong to God. Verse 20. And our bodies should be used to glorify God, not satisfy our own sinful desires. Now, sometimes, of course, within the marriage relationship, that that desire isn't sinful. But um, outside the marriage relationship, it is sinful to fulfill those um, desires. So that, in my mind, is why it's a sin against the body. Uh, Our body itself becomes the instrument of the sin and our whole body takes part in that. Okay, this last question is, what is the church's role in helping widows and widowers? What is our church doing for these widows and widowers? All right, Uh, James 1 and verse 27 tells us the pure and undefiled religion Before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Okay, so Paul mentions, or not Paul, James mentions um, orphans and widows, and we're to visit them. The word visit there, it's more than just visit as we think of visiting. It means to render aid, to render assistance. It's not just widows, though. It's orphans and widows. Um, we and, and in, in that time, orphans and widows were two classes of people who, uh, in many ways, were helpless. Okay, they needed, they had to have physical assistance to get by. Okay, and pure religion involves doing that. Now, um, our widows and widowers today, of which we have many, physically speaking they're not as hard off as a widow or widower would have been back in Jesus' time. So that aspect of it isn't this quite the same. But if it was, and I'm sure sometimes it may be, um, then we would need to meet those physical needs, okay, in whatever way we can. Uh, I think, from my experience, more often now, the needs that need to be met, the, the things that we need to be helping with, are the loneliness, 
um, you know, the, 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 the depression and, and, and from losing a spouse. And, and we need to do what we can and pray for those individuals and, and strive to help them. Now, it's, it's good to have programs, okay? There's nothing wrong with having programs. Um, and, I mean, we, you, you all know that Dayton has organized widows and widowers um, meals, and I think that's great. Um, but let's not fall into the trap of thinking that because we don't have some big organized program um, that these things aren't getting done, okay? Now, can we do better? Obviously, all of us can always do better, and I'm included in that. But it, it falls upon each of us individually um, in the absence of you know, an organized program within the church it falls upon us as individuals to do what we can, okay? So don't, let's not fall into the trap of thinking because we don't have a widows and widowers program that we don't care about our widows and widowers. We certainly do, and I hope uh, that all of us um, strive to encourage and help our widows and widowers. So what is our church doing? Well, I hope, I hope we're supporting our widows and widowers and... Um, Again, even though there's no official oversight of that, uh, I'm sure that it is taking place uh, among our members. What, so there's the physical aspect of meeting their physical needs, but there's also the um, spiritual aspect and, uh, of trying to help with um, the pain and the loss of losing a spouse. And again, I know that I could do better at this, and we could all probably do better at this, uh, and we should strive to improve in that area. Okay, that was all for the questions. Again, thank you for submitting those to those who did. Hopefully the answers were helpful. Uh, we're going to now, at this time, offer an invitation. If there are any here who have never obeyed the gospel, we offer that invitation at the end of every lesson. If you believe Jesus to be the Son of God, then Jesus says we have to repent turn from our sins, we have to confess our faith in him, and we have to be baptized for the remission of sins. If you've not done that, we offer you that invitation as we're about to sing a song. Uh, most of us have, but maybe you've fallen away. Maybe you're that brother who's sending a sin unto death, and maybe just nobody knows it but you. Or whatever it may be, um, if you need to have the prayers of the church. We would be glad to pray for you and help you in that. We encourage you to come as we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.